Hey, baby. We're in fucking trouble. Welcome back, everybody. Today, we're discussing Watchmen, Season 1, Episode 7, An Almost Religious Awe. The title refers to an excerpt from the comics when Dr. Manhattan was winning the Vietnam War for America. Often, they ask to surrender to me personally. Their terror of me balanced with an almost religious awe. The episode begins with a documentary-style introduction to John Osterman. Uh, his father fled Nazi Germany, founded his own business, and reared a human that would eventually step into the intrinsic field chamber and become Dr. Manhattan. The importance of this introduction and this reaffirmation of his origin is that they want everyone to know plainly this is how a supreme being was created. We later learn this is a major goal of the 7K, and we're also told that Russia is working on their own intrinsic field generator. So you have to wonder if this teleportation machine won't be getting Senator Keene into this chamber when the time is right. The documentary also again brings to light this idea that Vietnam wasn't as black and white as the American government would have you believe. It had a real cost. Now that the war has been won, American culture hinders or in some regard consumes authentic Vietnamese culture. It's the tragic side effect of war, and I think it could also perhaps apply to South Korea right now. Uh, American culture is a massive part of their lives now because of tensions with North Korea, and America is offering protection because of their geographical strategic position, but it's also affecting what would be their uninfluenced ways of life and traditions. The real question that we have to answer is the morality of that. Is that okay? Surely a more united, integrated, uniform species of human is better, more advanced. No? Or does the integration of all cultures into a mixing pot lessen each individual way of life? As America itself is the great melting pot, I don't see that I've lost anything growing up. I've greatly enjoyed my sample of each embedded culture and find things like cultural appropriation absolutely ridiculous, because surely we all want to be better and better ourselves through emulation of different people. Nothing wrong with doing that tastefully uh, or respectfully. Learning from others is how we advance as a society and learn more about ourselves. But all of that to say that it's complicated and oh so fascinating to think about. That's the dynamic at play here. And it's why them becoming an American state is such a big deal. We took them over and seemingly because of the tone of this opening scene destroyed their authentic Vietnamese experience with American capitalism. Makes you really wonder about True's plans here. You know, someone whose mother lived through this war directly tells us that she was affected adversely in the process, and she's vowed to never leave Vietnam, making herself take mounds of dirt with her wherever she travels. It's odd, and I think could you know, really tell us something about her intentions here. The documentary transitions to Angela buying a movie titled Sister Night, the nun with the motherfucking gun, which may be the greatest tagline ever. Notice the blue in her outfit here and throughout this entire episode. The year is 1987, and it's VVN Day, a joyous event celebrating U.S. winning the war in Vietnam, and since the symbol on the banner here isn't the American flag, it's the Dr. Manhattan symbol, we can see that half of this country idolizes him for his contribution, and the other half clearly does not. We see puppets reenacting the war. This is a callback to a quote from Dr. Manhattan when he tells Lori that we're all puppets, Lori. I'm just the puppet who can see the strings. In light of my study into determinism recently, I think that what he's saying is that everything's connected, a string of events that has been and always will be controlling us, starting all the way back to a single moment that started everything. He has no more control into what happens than we do, and he can just see the string connecting everything. We learn Angela loses her parents to this unrest, and then she wakes up on the floor. True has been taking care of her for some time now, waking up a total of five times like this because of the drug overdose, forgetting each time that this has happened. True gives her the tutorial injection, which brings up this idea of chemical reactions so finely tuned that they can make you see things. Imagine getting a shot and watching the entire Game of Thrones series without the last two seasons so that it's not sullied. I mean, how cool would that be? 
Her grandfather is nowhere to be found this episode, which for me is extremely odd and off-putting. Angela lies to True about what woke her up, and we learn that we're 12 hours from the Millennium Clock being activated. Cal tries to see her, but is refused, and we get this shot of Red Scare eating Cheetos with a fork. Filthy communist. Hologram Beyond tells Cal that he can't come in for his own safety, which may allude to the use of tachyons in this clock. Tachyons are the only thing that can really harm Dr. Manhattan. In the comics, it's how Vite was able to hide his plan from Manhattan. It prevented him from seeing the future. It's not clear what more they could do, but it could be instrumental in destroying Dr. Manhattan because it doesn't give him foresight. So this might be a really useful tool in Senator Keene's work later on. He asks for Agent Blake and we come to her driving in the car, listening to tapes of Angela while she was knocked out. She apparently said everything that was happening, so, you know, that's pretty useful. We get a call from Petey and we learn that Looking Glass survived. How? Well, four 7K members showed up and five bodies exist with an unknown not wearing a mask. Wade is definitely hiding himself among the dead bodies here, and will use this to probably infiltrate their organization and learn the truth for himself. Because again, he is the unsure character. He has no clue where to align. His faith in everything has been destroyed. So what he wants is information, and he'll probably be like, you know, the 13th man coming in and saving the day kind of thing. Or I propose that he will at least try to, you know, do something grand to make up for what he did to Angela, or overall just be the hero that he has always wanted to be giving his own life. Um, I think that's pretty, pretty likely. Agent Blake goes to Judd's widow riding a white horse, and Blake tells her who killed her husband. We also get this moment of Blake guessing everything correctly, Joe Keen being the mastermind behind everything and doing so to get his seat in the Oval Office originally, which we discussed previously, but more than that, he's now trying to be a blue god. The scene was excellent. Uh, the delivery made me call out what, like when <laughs> Mrs. Crawford started talking, uh, like it was so shocking, even Blake didn't know how to react, nor was I expecting a trap door under the couch. It was comical without being too over the top. Like Lori calls it out later on, like, you know, who would do that? And I don't know. I think it, I think it works here. I don't, I don't really fault them for this being how she gets captured. We come back to Beyond, which we later learn is True's mother, and she's working on her dissertation. It's on the adaptive function of empathy and the role of rage suppression in social cohesion. And that is a mouthful, which is a huge call out to this idea of humanity 2.0 and those that can understand trauma being better than those that cannot. Remember, the Millennium Clock is the first wonder of the new world to them. Be it nostalgia reign or mesmerism through global broadcast, empathetic people are better people in their eyes. And maybe mine too. I just fear that they're going to do something really unempathetic to get to this point of having a better humanity. We see a flashback of Angela first wanting to become a police officer. They find the person who caused the death of her parents and execute him on the confirmation of a child. It's odd that she wants to listen, or maybe it's not. I think that I'd like to listen. I think that I'd like to watch probably, you know, just to make sure that they're actually dead, but whatever. I, I think it reminds us of that anger that was in her grandfather, kind of like a subtle push that it also exists in her. We next come to Vite on trial for one year straight. The entire thing feels like it was done to punish Vite, like they had to have a year long trial with all the evidence of his misdeeds stacked against him so that he could finally understand his immoral actions, not just because he tried to escape. I pointed out earlier in this series that his marooning here could be self-imposed, and part of me believes that that may be closer aligned now, because it's only when he hears the word guilty that he sheds a tear. I mean, moments before that, he let out a fart to defend himself. That weight of circumstance is hitting him. He who can do no wrong has wronged, and it's now upsetting. It's now real for him. Regardless of how he got here, I think that the more important thing is, what's the point? I mean, what's the point of him learning this lesson at all? Is he in purgatory and destined to repeat this forever as a punishment? Or is there a better reason for him being here and learning to be empathetic to the people that he harmed? Which makes me believe perhaps none of this is real. Just perhaps he's being injected with that liquid that makes you see whatever they want you to see. Perhaps the Save Me D wasn't Dan or Dr. Manhattan, it was Save Me Daughter, which comes full circle if you consider that True wanted her parents to be there when she launched the Millennium Clock, and we've yet to meet 
her father. Some people believe that it's the comedian. Some people believe that it's Dr. Manhattan himself. I think that Adrian Veidt is a really good candidate to fill this role. I think that the wordplay between True and Veidt that we pointed out episodes ago um, also aligns to this. She idolizes him, you know, so I, I could definitely see it. The court scene was honestly so, so good. I mean, it, it, another case of beautiful writing, undoubtedly. Uh, the, the prosecution closing argument was beautiful, and when the judge claimed that he pities the jury for having to judge Veidt because they're not his peers, I expected 12 cloned Veidt's to walk through that door and boom, pigs. The importance of pigs is to mock Veidt and his beliefs. It's called the doctrine worthy only of swine, which is a mocking phrase of hedonism or utilitarianism uh, that says if you are only driven by things that you believe are good or will bring you happiness, you are no different, no more complex than pigs. Yeah, I mean, it, it is perfect. It is so freaking good, man. I mean... Ooh. Then we come to the transition on this statue, and even the first time we saw it, people pointed out that Veidt could possibly be in this statue, a carbonite bath kind of thing. It's possible, I suppose. True tells Angela that she has a secret plan to save humanity, which in this universe means that people will probably die, uh, then brings up the research on memory and how rare it is for people to completely forget an event like Cal's car crash, which hints that perhaps True knows Cal's true identity. Uh, I think maybe later confirmed when they're talking in the globe room. Uh, they discuss the fact that Bian is her mother being retrained in a new body, slowly integrating her memories. And that is pretty wild and introduces a whole stream of things and directions that this could go. It basically means that immortality is possible in this universe and that that compared to her clock is not her life's work. So you really have to wonder what this clock is going to do if immortality exists, she's done it, and the clock is still somehow better than that. The PA system comes on and tells us that it's four hours to activation and that all personnel should report to the viewing platform. True's invocation is for their ears only, which is a pretty weird thing. There's a few meanings here. It's probably just the little speech that she gives later on, but in light of me Googling the definitions to confirm, it could also mean summoning a deity or uh, the supernatural. Well, Blue God is a very real thing in this universe. And similarly, the incantation used to invoke a deity, which, I mean, after their conversation, Angela literally goes out and brings the big guy back to life. Nothing really concrete here. I just want to point out the word choice because uh, I, you know, I, I thought that was cool. The broadcast ends with the future thanks you for your service, which again, True's entire being has been about time. I, I discussed this a few episodes ago and it hasn't really come back until just now, but whatever she's up to is time related. And it's best that we don't forget that because I think that there's a lot of other things that are being put in our face that are much more obvious to her plot, but those facts have to mean something. Uh, otherwise they're useless information and, and we, the audience don't need to know them at all. Yet we do. We transition to the Cyclops layer and get a better look at the symbol, which is an eye with a single dot orbiting around on a loop, just like Dr. Manhattan's logo. Perhaps just to symbolize that their new goal with Keen is wanting to become a blue god himself. But I don't know, maybe there's more. We see Lori tied up with engineers working on the portal and these little boxes all over the place. They have the true logo all over them. And I think that they're tachyon devices used to mask the activity uh, like Vite did with the squid dropping. But what's interesting is that I first thought that these were being stolen from True. And that could still be the case. You know, we haven't really seen anything that links them together as if they're working on the same side. In fact, it's exactly the opposite. They've given us plenty of information that the 7K and True are not on the same side. But you really have to think that True has trillions of dollars. She is a literal trillionaire. And that money can buy countries and it can buy armies. There's nothing stopping her from getting a giant drone based tank and blowing up this entire thing, uh, period. I bring this up overall because there is a slim but still existing possibility that True and the 7K are working together or True is allowing things to happen so that her end goal is overall reached, regardless of how Senator Keene and his plan work. Blake interrupts the bad guy revealing his big plan, much to my resentment. 
I think that it's a trap. I mean, she falls into a trap door moments ago, and she is now the trap door that will bring Dr. Manhattan here and let the 7K kill him. I still think the Russians will have something to do with this because they mentioned it earlier, Chekhov's gun now in full effect. Also, uh, because of what John Osterman did. His transition to Mr. Blue Sky took him months, multiple months to finish. It wouldn't be that dramatic if Cal could just destroy him uh, before that lengthy process was complete. Also, I want to address my previous video saying that the group might be the good guys in this series because they were trying to reveal the truth of the squid attack to the world. I think from this we can agree that he lied to Wade, you know, so thus we were lied to, and his intention is just that being an all-powerful blue god meaning overall they're the bad guys they're you know fucking racist cunts uh unless again this was all a facade to reveal the truth but i've always stated that i thought this guy was creepy as shit so you know i'm taking it lady true gives her invocation and she reveals that at 30 she built the first micro fusion spacecraft this may not be brought up at all it kind of just means that they now have better space travel likely making it possible for a place like europa to exist at all uh, giving credit that it's not an illusion and that it is very real uh, she also brings up her failures, nostalgia, thinking humanity would evolve naturally and transform, but they became addicted to their past. Again, bringing back this idea of AA and working past trauma, becoming more empathetic, a better human. Angela opens the door and finds an elephant. So I've wanted to bring up elephants for the past five or so episodes, ever since we first saw True. Uh, I've noticed it everywhere, on the hourglass, behind her on walls, her logo, uh, but I've never had an opportunity to. It just kept getting cut from super long breakdowns like this. Uh, so I have to stop talking about the show at some point. I'm kicking myself now for not bringing it up, but yeah, it's been in our faces. The practical science of this, I'm unsure, but the theory is because of the size of the, an elephant brain, roughly four times that of a human, that they would have a lot of the stuff needed to resolve the issues if nostalgia overdoses happen. Also, the phrase, an elephant never forgets, comes to mind. What I'm more interested in is why she had one on hand. I mean... Sure, she's loaded, she can buy countries if she pleases, but perhaps this is foreshadowing uh, this being in their plan if things go south with Master Humanity 2.0. I mean, this room already had a cage built for this animal, right next to the regular rooms that people sleep in, so they expected this or planned for it just in case. We next come to June meeting Angela as a baby. The moment was wonderful. A young girl finally reconnected with family after being in a home, and sure enough, it's ruined by the ever-intrusive fact of life, death. Just as June found out that her baby died in Vietnam, so does she, and Angela is alone once more. I loved this scene. It was so uh, wholesome, heartfelt, I don't know, but them talking about why she chose Sister Knight speaks to the importance of representation in film and why she became who she was. But she wakes up and goes to floor zero, finding a giant blue earth floating in the black of space. I'm really curious about what's on floor negative one, first of all, uh, and all of the prayers that were sent to Manhattan were actually just sent to True. Then we learned that Manhattan wasn't on Mars at all, but on Earth, and my mind instantly knew it was Cal. This was actually a pretty popular theory, with the biggest surge of support coming in after uh, Cal spoke to the kids and said that nothing happens after you die. Then more so when people figured out that the dildo uh, was named Excalibur, X Cal Abar. So, the showrunners love wordplay, which makes me wonder if Joe Keen actually points to joking, you know, like their plan is a joke, while the real threat is true slash Vite. Regardless, True confirms in less than an hour they will capture him, kill him, and then become him. I do think that Dr. Manhattan dies here, since it's revealed to be Cal, and we've seen him read two books now that the protagonist dies, and True, again, has this weird knowledge or foresight into the future. Uh, yeah, I mean, I think he dies. I think that maybe he sacrifices himself for uh, the greater good of humanity, but I think True knows all of this, and I don't know how she knows. It's also interesting that Angela knew. I think that's maybe the most shocking part. Like, I'm more curious about their first contact between Angela and Cal slash John and how this thing started, because she says that his name is John, 
like they met while he was still John, and created Cal to mask his identity, and hid his powers inside a trinket embedded into his own head. The only issue I kind of see here is that it's going to be really hard to explain why Lori didn't recognize him unless, you know, he changed his face. I mean, he'd be black instead of blue. <laughs> I, I'm pretty sure if my wife turned blue, I'd still know that it was her. Agent Blake even says that he's no Cal, which he very much is, so... Like, what? Yeah, I don't know. When Angela gets home, two 7K operatives are watching her house. I think one may be Wade, but it seems like in this setting that they would need to talk to each other, and his voice isn't really one that they can cover. Angela beats Cal's head in, and man, her story is fucked. Like, she has had loss after loss in her life. I mean, her entire lineage, like, is tragic, and now has to beat her husband's head open to get out Dr. Manhattan. Tragic story, hopefully we get a happy ending in all of this. The episode ends with Angela pulling out the trinket as David Bowie's Life on Mars plays us out. Another incredible episode, and we have two episodes remaining before the end. We also get confirmation from the showrunners that Night Owl will not make an appearance this season, so that is unfortunate, but if season two does happen, possibly, uh, you know, maybe we'll see him. But with that, we come to the end of this episode. Big shout out to all of my wonderful subscribers, including this month's highest tier donors, Chris Cole, Robert Holtz, and Michael Link. If you haven't yet, please check out the Patreon channel. Uh, it's just another way to support me if you would like. Thank you everyone for helping me hit my subscriber goals as we near the end of this series. We will most certainly keep making videos about this and we'll be looking for more to cover. So comment down below exactly what you want to see. Much love everybody and I can't wait to talk to you all again soon.